I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi with a big family. Uh, my, our house was always filled with uh, friends and family and a lot of faith. I left Mississippi and went to college in Dallas, Texas. I graduated from Southern Methodist University and it was in Dallas where I started my own business and where I met my husband, John. We were actually introduced by his mom, um, who was a client of mine. And so John and I hit it off and we got married and left Dallas, started moving all over the country. He was in a very good job that was kind of fast paced, so it kept us moving quite a bit. 10 years into our marriage, we had our first son, John, and four years after that, Jake entered the scene and uh, completed the family circle for us. Life was good because we thought we were where we were supposed to be. You know, when you're, when you're in this world, you, you, you think, okay, I go to school and then I get married and then I, you know, find work that, uh, that is enjoyable and, and something that I'm good at. And, you know, you're sharing your life with someone special and then you're creating these lives with these little people that you're bringing into the world. And, you know, you have friends and you have family and you're healthy and we had no reason to believe that, you know, life was going to change. Um, that we were just going to move along and everything was going to remain stellar. Um, and of course, for all of us, life happens and things do change. Um, we're just not prepared sometimes for, for what is going to come our way. And a lot of times we're not even sure that we're strong enough to deal with it. We hear other people's stories and we're like, well, they're different, they could handle that. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that, you know what, we all may be different in what we may be experiencing, but we all get to choose how we wanna handle it. And John and I got to choose how to handle a really, really difficult situation for us. Um, he had been experiencing some uh, loss of strength on his left side and had been experiencing that for close to a year and didn't say anything to me about it uh, because he thought it was just a pulled nerve or pulled muscle. So he'd been seeing a neurologist and he kept going back like every three months and after the third visit, this is about the ninth or 10th month, um, the doctor called in another physician to consult with him. And they came to this diagnosis and they knew that John was headed to Mayo for his uh, executive physical. So they gave him the paperwork and he came home and I never will forget, I was, I was in bed reading and he walked in and he was just as white as a ghost. And I looked at him and I said, honey, what's wrong? And he said, I, 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 have, I have this disease. I said, what, 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 slow down. He goes, I'm gonna die. I said, John, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, they think I have ALS. And I looked at him and I said, what is ALS? He said, it's Lou Gehrig's disease. And I said, well, what is Lou Gehrig's disease? And he said, Rachel, I'm gonna die. And I said, well, wait, 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 wait. So I didn't really get it all right then and there. And so he said, they want you to come with me back to Mayo. Um, and I said, all right. So we went to Mayo and diagnosing this disease is excruciatingly painful because what they want to do is just rule out everything that it can't be because no doctor wants to give this diagnosis and no person wants to get this diagnosis because for those of us who don't know what ALS is, because I certainly didn't, um, it is a disease that progressively weakens the body 
while the mind stays strong. It's terminal. There is no cure. There is no treatment. And there is no hope. And in our world today, we're not used to hearing things like that. And when the doctor looks at you and says, you have between two and five years to live, your whole world just kind of stops. You don't really hear anything else. And John and I, left Mayo, he looked over at me and we were driving home. It had been a, such a long, long day. And he looked at me and he said, I've got a headache. And I looked at him and I said, I've got a heartache. And I just, I just couldn't hardly process anything else. So we came home and we knew that this was, this was big news. And uh, we chose not to share it with our kids right away because John wasn't really symptomatic. His foot had dropped a bit, but he looks perfectly normal. You know, he was a strong, athletic guy. He was handsome, he was charming. And right then, at that particular moment, you didn't know, you wouldn't know that anything was wrong with him or that he was dying. So we chose to wait until we went to see his family um, to tell them in person because John's parents had already lost a son 10 years earlier to an incurable disease of which there was no hope and there was no treatment. So we knew that we were really, really going to have to handle this differently with them. Um, so we, we just kept it to ourselves. And a couple of weeks later, John was let go from his job. This, this position that he had aspired to and had been working at so hard and so well. Through no fault of his own, they had no idea about his illness. And I just felt like we'd been run over by a truck, just left out there. Like, what happens now? What happens now? I, I just didn't know. But God knew, and, and, you know, for the longest time, my prayer was just, show me how to do this. Show me how to do this, God. I don't know how to do this. Show me how to do this. And then I realized, you know what? He would show me how to do it. Get me through this, Lord. Get me through this. Every day, just get me through this. And, and, and in that process, John and I, while we were looking for answers and just really saying, okay, Lord, what do you want us to do? How do we do this? We researched and looked at options and, and we stepped outside of the box in terms of traditional medical treatment. It was a place that I never, ever thought I'd go. I never thought that we'd be in a third world country in a compound with security all around it, getting an experimental treatment that's outlawed in the United States. If anyone would have ever told me that I would be doing that or that we would be doing that, I would have said, no way. But when life gives you a circumstance that you have, you have no experience in how to handle, you just have to say, all right, let me check this out. Let me see where I can go. Let me see what else we can do. And what I knew for John 
was that he was going to exhaust every possibility. We didn't jeopardize our kids' future. We didn't um, risk anything that we couldn't afford to. But we made sure that he did what he needed to do in order to know that at the end of this journey, he had done everything that he could possibly do. And there was a great gift in that. Because in knowing John, he was very analytical, very logical, and he did things very with a plan. There was always a plan. And after we got this diagnosis, guess what? The plans, the plans changed. And so we found ourselves having conversations that a lot of us don't like to have about death and dying and wills and estate planning and life support. And what do you do when you can't, when you can't talk anymore? Or what do you do when you, I can't watch you eat anymore because you're choking so much that I'm afraid, I'm afraid for you. I can't watch you eat because I don't know, I'm not sure I can handle that if you choke. You know, or what do we do when you can't breathe on your own anymore? What do you want to do? Those are really hard conversations to have. And when you have to have those with somebody that you love so much and somebody who you've been with for so long, it doesn't get any easier. It doesn't get any easier. And sometimes after you've had the conversation, then you have to come back to it because sometimes it's just too much to process all at once. But John and I, we did it. We got through those conversations. We got through those, those times and we realized after everything was said and done that this disease, that this disease would end his life. And it did. And while this disease did take his life, um, it didn't take his spirit. He finished well. And I was so proud of him. And so happy and grateful that he was able to go as he wanted at home with his family, resting peacefully and just being comfortable. In the end, there wasn't anything, there wasn't anything more that he wanted than that. And I am so thankful that he finished so well. So the boys and I are now on the next step of the journey. You know, I've got a 15-year-old and an 11-year-old, and I'm almost 50 myself on this new adventure of being a widow and a single parent. But what I know is that even though this isn't a place that I ever thought I'd be, is that it's, it's all right. And that that inner strength and that that inner faith that, that has been strengthened through this journey will not leave me. For all of us, life may not end happily ever after. It may not turn out the way that we thought it would. But what I do want to share is that hopefully ever after does exist for each and every one of us. It's that hope and it's that faith and it's that strength that will keep us moving forward and that will, that will allow us to live the life that God has intended for us.